Now, the kids in the classroom never complain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome to the fourth in a series of Ken Morrison lectures brought to you by uh, Lakehead Unitarian Fellowship. We are very happy to have so many people in the audience. Uh, it is customary at this time to acknowledge the presence and thank the following politicians here tonight. And I would like to recognize Senator Bob McKenzie. Okay. Okay. Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, uh, uh, MP Bruce Heyer of Hunter Bay Superior North. Um, Mary Kaziris representing uh, John Rafferty of Thunder Bay Atacoka. And Paul Hugh of Thunder Bay uh, City Council. Perhaps Paul would like to uh, uh, speak to us now. <laughs> city councillor and uh, particularly as chair of the poverty free uh, poverty reduction strategy that our city has embarked upon I am personally very happy to, to welcome everyone here tonight and our guest speaker in particular uh, because the topic is, is a timely one it's one that is of great concern for, for our, our citizens and our city so I am very much looking forward to tonight's talk, and I'm sure all of you are also. So, uh, welcome everyone, uh, welcome to our city, and uh, we'll get on with our meeting. Thank you, Paul. My name is Rob Van White. I'm a member of Lakehead Unitarian Fellowship, where I serve on this lecture committee, and also as a lay chaplain. We're the little church right across the street that you may have visited at some time, or perhaps you may have walked by and wonder who are the Unitarians? And there are about as many answers to that question as there are Unitarians. Uh, free thinkers, a uh, faith community that, that lets you build your own theology, no dogma, etc., etc. There is a joke about how many Unitarians it takes to change a light bulb um, and, uh, that perhaps would illustrate where we're coming from. Well, how many? Well, we choose not to make a statement either in favor of or against the need for a light bulb. However, if you're in your own journey, you have found that light bulbs work for you. That is wonderful, and you must change it. <laughs> All this is to introduce Ken Morrison. It could be said that he changed a good number of light bulbs around town and the country. Many here will have met him, but for those of you who have not, you had to say he was a remarkable man of principle who was compelled to speak truth to power. In your brochure, it says he, he spoke firmly and frequently on the big issues of our time. And this is an understatement. 
One of the most important issues for him was the examination of the limits of tolerance in society. Another issue found him agitating against the big lies we're constantly getting from the power structures. He was a frequent letter writer to the Chronicle Journal and a constant irritant to the leadership of the NDP. <laughs> uh, not to forget the Canadian Unitarian Council. <laughs> Ken passed away in 2010, but be before he did, uh, he asked that we set up a series of lectures on the big ideas and hard questions of our time. This idea grew into an important social responsible activity for LUF. Today's lecture by Winnipeg health economist Dr. Evelyn Forger addresses quite directly the very first Unitarian principle embraced by Ken and Unitarians worldwide that we should affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. These lectures have been self-supporting because of the generosity of over 50 people who have contributed in the past. We greatly appreciate their support and invite their continued assistance and won't you consider helping us with a charitable donation to the Ken Morrison Lectures? There is a form on the back of your brochure. I just happen to have one if you need one. Um, and Jean Morrison can take your money tonight at the door. <laughs> uh, now, to give you... Oh! I, I'm sorry. Uh, Gene number two, Gene, Gene uh, Armstrong will take your money. Gene Morrison will sit there and, and behave yourself. <laughs> now, to give you an idea of how the evening will unfold, after these introductions and Dr. Forger's lecture, there will be an opportunity for a limited number of questions. And I'm telling you this now so that if you are inclined to ask one, you will have the opportunity at your seat to focus yourself on your question and limit yourself to very few remarks. I'm sure you get the message. Uh, before I turn over the microphone to Jean Morrison, I must acknowledge the public spiritedness of the Board of Directors and the Social Responsibility Committee of the Bay Credit Union, who sponsored this evening's venue and the refreshments. The Bay <laughs> Is there someone here from the Bay Credit Union who we can eyeball and think? I'm an early member. <laughs> Now, I, no, serious, quite serious, seriously, the Bay Credit Union is an organization who truly walks the talk of their principles, and we are most appreciative of their assistance. I would like to introduce Jean Morrison now and invite her to say a few words. Jean. It's a big thrill to see so many of you here, and I know that Ken would have been thrilled to, know, to see so many of you because, as Rob said, this is his idea. Until the end, Ken's mind was always buzzing around <laughs> with ideas. At first, he thought computers were a useful, useless gadget, but once he got onto mine, he had to get one of his own. <laughs> and that didn't stop him from always being at the computer, typing out his ideas and forwarding them to others. 
he had the opportunity to share his ideas, mostly at the Unitarian Fellowship across the street and through his letters to the editor. Now, he didn't always have encouragement from the spouse, I must confess. <laughs> but nevertheless, right to, it was at the very end when he came up with the idea of having these lectures. And uh, so I hope, I know what kind of wonderful speech we're going to have because I heard her guest being interviewed on CBQ today. So it's, it was a real little taste of the wonderful things we're going to hear. And I do hope that her remarks will stimulate everyone here to try to do their bit to help make this a fairer world for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. I invite Jay Stapleton to introduce our speaker. Hello. I'm up here today as more of a an aficionado, or a, a fan, I guess, of social sciences and how they can be applied in public policy. Our society has this, it's almost a cruel trick that the effects of poverty are also the causes of poverty. And this cycle has trapped a great number of people. And it's a constant question, in political debates especially, of how do we break that cycle? And it seems like it should have come up before now that maybe we could just buy it out. Maybe the solution to poverty is money. <laughs> Perhaps what we need for people to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps is to give them a pair of boots. And I've been reading on this subject for several months as part of my studies and came across Dr. Perge's uh, papers and it struck me as an idea that seems so obvious it must have spent a lot of time being buried as obvious ideas all often do. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Evelyn Forget. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here tonight and I am so pleased that so many of you took time out of your schedules to come and listen to me talk about my little project on a Friday night. I've been working on this for a number of years, and um, what I want to do, as this is coming up on the screen, I want to take you back in your minds to the 1970s. And I look around the audience, and I think about half of you could probably remember the 1970s. <laughs> and the other half of you should remember your history classes. And for those of us who can remember, we remember the 1970s as being a time of pretty significant social upheaval, but it was also a time of significant economic upheaval. And it's important to remember that because people always point to the economy as the reason we can't do anything. We can't fix poverty because, well, you know, economic times are bad. Let's wait until things are better. But if you remember the 1970s, the 1970s were a time when interest rates spiked at about 18 or 20 percent, inflation was running at 10 percent, unemployment was far higher than it ever had been, and all of the economic tools that we thought we had to fix it didn't seem to be working anymore. There were a couple of big oil price shocks, as there have been recently. Economic times during the 1970s were pretty tough, too. So. <laughs> Who changed this? 
and swap you. Here swap we go. You. <laughs> Public embarrassment. I have a paper copy in my coat pocket. I never trust people with laptops. It's already open. No, no, You're such a teacher. <laughs> ambitious social experiment that's ever taken place in Canada. In the province of Manitoba, in two communities, Winnipeg and a small town of Dauphin, Manitoba. Dauphin had about 10,000 people in the town proper and another 2,500 in the rural municipality in the farmland around Dauphin. And in those two communities, they attempted to run a guaranteed annual income experiment. Now, the payouts to the families in these experiments were relatively modest. Um, the, the easiest way to think of it is to think of it as a refundable tax credit. It's very much like the child tax credit. If the family had no income from any other source, they received a stipend that would be about equal to what they would have received on provincial welfare. <coughs> The innovation of the guaranteed income was that for every dollar they received from other sources, they got to keep part of their benefits, right? So if they earned $10 on the labor market, their benefits were reduced by $5. If they earned $100 on the labor market, their benefits would be reduced by $50. <laughs> and what that means is that unlike provincial welfare, which really doesn't do very much for the working poor, the income scheme, the guaranteed annual income, supplements the incomes of people who are working at very low wage jobs as well. So that was the distinction. How are we doing with the slides? as a refundable tax credit. That's the way to do it. Right? So if you think about the child benefit, if the family has no income, there's a certain payout. As their income increases, the benefits are reduced. And so that's how it works. And they called it at the time a negative income tax. Right? So they essentially paid people that they had no income. As their income increased, the benefit that they received got smaller until eventually they received enough money to pay income taxes. So the difference between provincial welfare and the guaranteed annual income is that provincial welfare has a very strong threshold effect. 
as Funded 75% by the federal government and 25% by the provincial government in Manitoba. Um, federally, it was the uh, Trudeau Liberals. Uh, provincially, it was the very first ever NDP government in Manitoba. It was a very young government. Um, they uh, were having quite a lot of fun because uh, the opposition called the communists. The, uh, yeah. the um, um, so they, they actually played it played it very strongly, and they took this on. And, and um, in Canada, this project was um, very much um, a social democratic project. This was one of five guaranteed annual income experiments that were run across North America. There were actually four in the US, and in the US, the support for these projects was very much from the other end of the political spectrum. Oddly enough, one of the big supporters in the US was Milton Friedman, a name that might mean something. <laughs> Um, so the, 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 this, is the, this is an idea that actually had quite a lot of support right across the political spectrum. On the left, people were looking at it from the perspective of social justice. This is about ensuring that everybody has enough to survive. On the right, people were looking at it as a simplification of the way we delivered social assistance, an elimination of duplicated bureaucracies. This is actually a very simple um, program to operate, so it's, it's a relatively cheap program to operate and those were the savings that the right was looking for. There's also built into the scheme, if you think about it, um, a, a strong um, incentive to work. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting better and better. <laughs> no income from any other source, they received an amount of money that was about equal to what they would have received in provincial welfare. So for people without any income, from a financial point of view, they would have been equally well off on the two programs. So for those people, it isn't a matter of which program was better. They received the same amount of money for both. There were other aspects of the program that I'll talk about in a minute that made it superior for people without income. For people who did earn low wages, however, for minimum wage workers, for people who didn't work enough hours to generate a reasonable living on the labor market, this program provided a supplement that they wouldn't have received through the existing social programs. So it covered many more people um, than the existing provincial welfare. Now the Mincome experiment had two experimental sites in Manitoba. One was in Winnipeg, and as I said, one was in Dauphin, Manitoba. And the Dauphin site was interesting because it was the only site in all five experiments across North America that was a saturation site. And what is meant by a saturation site is that everybody in town got to participate. In Winnipeg, it was only a very small proportion of the population, but in Dauphin, everybody received the promise that if their income fell below the threshold, they'd receive a top up, they'd receive a stipend. And the purpose of the Mincome Project was to answer a question that bothered a lot of people at the time. If you give people money and you don't make them work, 
Why would anybody work? Why wouldn't everybody quit their job? So the purpose of this experiment was to find out if, in fact, everybody quit their job, if the number of hours worked fell dramatically. Now, some research was done on the labor market results at the time. And it was discovered that the number of hours worked did fall under the income experiment in Winnipeg. In fact, they fell by about 13%. And that sounds like a lot. It sounds like a very damaging statement to say that if you introduce a guaranteed annual income, people are going to work 13% fewer hours. But there are a couple of really interesting results that come out of that if you look at it more closely. It turns out that grown-up people who have real jobs don't quit them. Nobody quits a job earning $50,000 a year because they'd like to live on $10,000 a year. Those jobs, people continue to work. The people who reduced the number of hours they worked fell into two categories. First of all, married women. Married women used the guaranteed income to buy themselves longer maternity leaves. Okay. In the 1970s, maternity leaves were about six weeks. And with the guaranteed income, people used that money to extend maternity leaves for, in many cases, up to a year. So they essentially did what we've decided as a society is a very positive thing. They stayed home with newborn children for longer periods of time to enhance bonding and family functioning. The other group of people who reduced the number of hours they worked dramatically were, and here I'm using the language of the period, young unattached males. And young unattached males reduced the number of hours they worked by up to 80%. And if you're not a supporter of a guaranteed annual income, that sounds terrible. among adults working full-time jobs, significant effects for married women who use the guaranteed income to buy themselves longer maternity leaves, and young unattached males who reduce the hours they work by up to 80%. And you'll see I've used slightly different uh, language on the slide. Um, because when I looked a little closer at the data, it turned out that I found some of those young unattached males. They were in math class. Um, they reduced the number of hours they worked by taking their first full-time job at a slightly older age. So instead of leaving school at the age of 16, as they were legally entitled to do, some of them decided to stay in high school just a little bit longer, and I'll show you that in a minute. And so instead of taking their first full-time job at 16, they might have taken their first full-time job at 17 or 18. And when you count the number of hours worked, that means a pretty significant reduction in the number of hours. Hard to see that as a bad thing. So we did get a reduction in the number of hours worked on the whole, that's probably a pretty positive outcome. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I was interested in the health and social effects of income. And um, one of the things that happened was that the research funding started to run out midway through the experiment. Um, the economic conditions of the 1970s were a real challenge, and they were a challenge um, both for the experimenters and also for the politicians. And about two years into the experiment, the government in Manitoba changed, and that very first ever NDP government in Manitoba was replaced by a much less sympathetic government, who decided that they really weren't prepared to put more money into the experiment. And a couple of years later, the Trudeau government was replaced in Ottawa. So the economic challenges and the political changes meant that the experiment started to run out of money. Now the experiment was run by economists, and in particular it was run by labor economists, and they were interested in that work question, how much did people work? They weren't nearly as interested in the health and social effects, and so they reacted to the fall in their budget by firing all the soci sociologists on the project. <laughs> Um, they continued to pay the families, but all of those peripheral projects got cut. So we didn't find out anything 
about the health and social effects during the period. They weren't a primary um, research question. So the data was collected by questionnaire. It was put into boxes. There was no analysis done. No database was ever made uh, to answer any of the social questions. And then the boxes were promptly lost when the experiment ended. And um, this, is a, this is 1979. Boxes are gone. Um, and I began working on this project probably about five years ago. And I wondered whether I could find any of this data and whether I could um, find out what the effects might have been. And um, so I started to look for those boxes and it took me a little while to track them down. Um, I finally found them. I found the data. And I found 1,800 cardboard boxes full of data under the control of the Archives of Canada. And then I opened the boxes and I looked inside and promptly gasped because I found total disarray. Um, there were um, confused data, um, empty questionnaires, missing data. There were interviews with subjects and all kinds of things. It was largely unusable. And so I wondered whether there might be another way to get at some of the results from the, um, from the study. Okay. And, um, and this is just a little reminder. The project ran from 1974 to 1978. And the first thing I did was to call up my contact in the Department of Education in Manitoba. Thank you. And um, he spent all kinds of time um, developing spreadsheets for me on enrollment in all the high schools in Manitoba over the period of the 1970s. And I never quite know what colors are going to show up when I put this up. But what I did was to gather data on enrollment in grade 11 and grade 12. and um, I constructed these little bars where grade 12 enrollment as a percent of the previous year's grade 11 enrollment. I divided the data into three categories. Dauphin, Winnipeg, which is the only <coughs> urban center in Manitoba, and the rest of Manitoba. And if you look at that data, you see some really interesting things. If, if nothing happens to the underlying population, and everybody in grade 11 continues to grade 12, those bars should reach 100%. The bigger your dropout rate between grade 11 and grade 12, the more those bars fall below 100%. And so the money is flowing from the income between 1974 and 1978. So if you look at the first four years there, 1971, 1972, 1973, and even 1974, um, you see pretty much what you expect to see. Kids in Winnipeg are continuing on to grade 12 at a higher rate than the kids in, rest of, in the rest of Manitoba. There's virtually no difference between Dauphin and the rest of Manitoba. But look what happens in 1975. Continuation into grade 12 in Dauphin increases, and it increases so much that they're more likely to go to grade 12 in Dauphin than they are in Winnipeg. So that's a big spike. Look at 1976. The bar goes above 100%. Kids who'd already dropped out of school in Dauphin were coming back to grade 12, to finish grade 12 in Dauphin. 1977, Dauphin stays at almost 100%. 1978, Dauphin stays at almost 100%. Those kids are more likely to continue on to grade 12 and to finish high school than our kids even in an urban setting. Money stops by 1979, and the results in Dauphin go right back to where they were before, virtually indistinguishable from the rest of Manitoba. So what we've got is a little bubble there, a lucky cohort of kids, exactly coincident with Mincom, who are continuing on in high school. So that's a pretty dramatic finding. And I wanted to look at some other databases that might be available and might throw light on what was happening. And 
The next database I looked at was that one. <laughs> the, um, the data that's collected routinely um, through our universal health insurance, the equivalent of OHIP. Every time you go to visit a doctor, quite a lot of data is collected about you. Every time you spend time in the hospital, quite a lot of data is collected about you. This is an anonymized database, so I don't have people's names or addresses, but I know where they live. I have their six-digit postal code, and so I can place them. So if you've lived in Manitoba at any time since 1970, I've got you in the population registry, and I've got you identified by two numbers. There's a six-digit family number, which means that I can track family formation and family breakdown. I can track marriages and divorces. I can link parents to children. And I've got a nine-digit individual number, which means I can follow you over your life. I have your six-digit postal code of residence, which is updated every six months. And that means that I can link you to an awful lot of information about you on the long-form census. If you spend time in the hospital, I've got up to nine codes saying why you're there, up to nine diagnoses. I know how many days you were there, whether you're transferred between hospitals, and I know an awful lot about what happened to you while you were there. If you saw a doctor, I know what doctor it was and whether the doctor prescribed something to you and why you think you went to see him and what he, um, what he billed for. Um, it's tied into vital statistics, so I can confirm births and cause of death. And there's quite a lot, that, that database has gotten much richer. Right now we have well over 100 databases that are tied together. For the early 1970s, that was pretty much what I had. But that's quite a lot of data. And what that means is that I can go into that database and I can find everybody who's living in Dauphin during the period of income. I can find out whether they're going to the hospital, I know why they're going to the hospital. And so I decided to look at this data and to see whether I could find anything out about it. I want to make sure that any changes that happen are actually the result of income and not the result of something else. And so what I tried to do was to construct a comparison group, a group of people very much like the people who were living in Dauphin. I tried to find three other Manitobans who were li living in similar kinds of places and were similar kinds of people. And then I could compare what happened to the Dauphin residents to the other people because the only difference between them was whether or not they received the guaranteed income. Okay, so the first thing I did was to match on geography. Did you turn down one more? And um, so I've got Dauphin marked on the map. And if you know anything about Manitoba, you know that really there's only one urban center in Manitoba. And if you think about the 1970s, a town like Winnipeg is um, going through social changes at a much faster rate than many of the smaller towns in Manitoba. Um, and so I took everybody who was living in Winnipeg out of the database. And what I had left were a whole lot of people living in places very much like Manitoba. I took out of the database everybody living in northern Manitoba, because the north is different um, from the south. And I took out people who were living on reserves. And I did that because if you live on a reserve, your health care is the responsibility of the federal government. So you don't show up in the provincial database in quite the same way. And what that means is that I've got left in that database everybody who's living in places very much like Dauphin. And then I tried to find three similar kinds of people for every individual in Dauphin. One more, please. Um, so I'm at, you could do two more. Um, so I matched on other characteristics. First of all, I matched on individual characteristics because the biggest predictors of your health care utilization is how old you are and your sex. Secondly, I matched um, family size and, what, and similar kinds of families. So if you were living in a family with a sin single parent, I matched to other single parent families. And then I matched on community characteristics. 
Um, if you're living in a small town or if you're living in a rural area, I matched on that. And one more. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so I, I had everybody who was living in Dogfin matched to three other very similar people. And when I looked at it carefully, I found that there were excellent matches on all the matching variables, but I also went back to the long-form census to find out whether there were any differences between my subjects and my controls. And I found exactly two differences. Um, first of all, I found that if you were a farmer living in Dauphin, you were much more likely to be growing canola than if you were living elsewhere in the province. <laughs> now, I'm a city girl, and I looked at that and I thought, would that have any effect on health? And I have no way of knowing, so I went to the experts in the Faculty of Agriculture, and I said, okay, suppose you're farming canola and you're farming wheat. Any reason to think that the health outcomes would be different? And so all of these guys came up with some very creative explanations for why it might be different, but I didn't believe any of them. So I think it's probably, <laughs> probably not important. It's significant, but it's not important. The second difference is ethnicity, and I'm gonna leave that out there because it may or may not be important. Um, as you drive west across this country from Thunder Bay, you come across lots of little towns, and some of those little towns are Ukrainian towns, like Dauphin, and some of them are Dutch towns, and some of them are German towns, and some of them are Polish towns, and some of them are Mennonite towns. Turns out that Dauphin is more Ukrainian than controls. About a third of the people living in Dauphin claim to Ukrainian heritage. Among my controls, only about 10% were. So I'm gonna leave that question there. Does ethnicity matter? I don't think it does, and the reason I don't think it does is because the Ukrainian community has been established there for a pretty long time, and so in many cases we're talking about second, third, and fourth generation Manitobans. But I'll leave it there to talk about it. Okay, so I had pretty good controls. Um, what does it mean? Um, the first thing I wanted to know was whether they're any healthier, whether it mattered that they received um, the guaranteed income. So I looked at hospitalization rates among my subjects in Dauphin and my controls. That blue line represents Dauphin. And you can see that before 1974, Dauphin <coughs> residents are much more likely to be hospitalized than are the controls. From 1974 through 1978, those lines start to come together. By the end of the Mekong period, there's no significant difference between Dauphin and the controls. And if I put that in a slightly different way, that means that hospitalization rates among the Dauphin residents relative to the controls fell by about eight and a half percent. Now that's actually very significant because it turns out that Canada spends quite a lot of money on hospitals. In 1978, Canada was spending about seven and a half billion dollars a year on hospitals. Um, right now we're spending well over $50 billion a year on hospitals. So if we can reduce hospitalization rates by 8.5%, we're talking about a pretty significant savings in associated social programs. Now why should people be going into the hospital less simply because they receive a guaranteed annual income? <coughs> well, I think, I think we know that poor health is strongly related to poverty, but I wanted to find out exactly what diagnoses might be responsible for those outcomes. So I started to drill into the data a little bit um, more to see what I could find. And the first thing I looked at was a big category of hospitalizations called accidents and injuries. Now accidents and injuries are picking up all kinds of things. This category is picking up things like family violence and suicide attempts, the results of drunk driving, um, automobile accidents, workplace accidents, all those things are showing up in this category. And what do we find? This light line here at the bottom is my control group. And over the entire period, there's a slight increase in the number of hospitalizations, the rate of hospitalization for accidents and injuries. Before 1974, Dauphin residents are much more likely to be hospitalized for accidents and injuries than the controls. Between 1974 and 1978, those lines start to come together. 1978, no significant difference. I followed those people all the way to 1985, and the gap didn't open. So my Dauphin residents are, um, by the end of the period, 
no more likely than anybody else to be hospitalized for accidents and injuries. The second category that turned out to be significant was hospitalizations with mental health diagnoses. And again, over that period, you can see a slight increase over the period for the control group. Um, Dauphin again starts out with a higher rate of hospitalization. The gap closes during the period. By 1978, it disappears, and it doesn't reopen, at least until 1985. So mental health diagnoses are another very big reason why hospitalization rates declined. Okay, I looked at visits to family doctors. It turns out that um, the same pattern occurred with respect to family doctors. Um, Dauphin residents were, um, by the end of the period, we saw a significant reduction in the number of visits by Dauphinites relative to the controls. And uh, we also looked to see whether there were any other effects. And we looked for three specific effects. We looked at birth outcomes. By birth outcomes, I mean low birth weight babies, babies who died just before or just after birth, um, um, small babies. Um, we looked at birth rates, and we looked at birth rates because this was part of the political discussion of the period. If you remember all those irresponsible, unattached young men who were running away from their jobs, the other political argument at the time against the guaranteed annual income was that uh, birth rates would increase. People would stay home and have babies in order to increase their um, entitlement under the program. So we looked to see if, in fact, birth rates increased over the period. And thirdly, we looked at divorce rates. Now, that might sound odd. Um, I think a lot of people who, um, who, who work in the area can imagine a lot of marriages that probably should end. And a guaranteed annual income makes it possible for some of those marriages to win. People aren't staying together simply because um, they're afraid of the consequences if they leave abusive spouses. But that isn't exactly the way it was played out. This became a very political issue in the US. And in fact, it hit Congress and it hit the Senate. And it was being portrayed as an attack on the American family. When the initial data started to come into the US experiments, it looked like the divorce rate was soaring. And um, so the, um, the question was, uh, does a guaranteed annual income constitute an attack on the American family, or in this case, the Canadian family? And since I had the data, we decided to look at that as well. So first of all, oops, first of all, I looked at birth outcomes. Now, birth outcomes are always, or very often, strongly associated with poverty. And it turned out I didn't find any effects. And I was a little disappointed not to find them. I looked at birth outcomes as many different ways as I could think to look at them. And nothing showed up as significant. I think the biggest explanation for why that might have been is because of the small number of babies born. It was a town of 13,000, but 13,000 people don't actually generate that many babies over a period of four years. So I think statistically it was just not enough to show up. But I think there are two other reasons why we might not have seen those results. Um, poor birth outcomes are very often associated with poverty for two reasons. Uh, first of all, poor nutrition during pregnancy. And secondly, um, the lack of prenatal care. One of the things that um, distinguished Canada from the US during this period is that we did have universal health care. So whether you received a guaranteed annual income or not, you still had the same access to prenatal care. And secondly, this was a, a small town um, in Manitoba. And a lot of people were engaged in food production um, themselves. They had big gardens, they had chickens in the backyard. I don't think that poverty showed up as food insecurity in quite the same way that it would today, particularly in a large city. So I didn't find those results. I can also happily report that this is, um, this is a picture of the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Dauphin. And it's just there as a reminder that um, when we start talking about birth rates and divorce rates, there are a lot of other factors besides a guaranteed annual income that we have to take into account. Um, but um, you'll be happy to know that the birth rates did not increase. And in fact, um, birth rates fell dramatically and often during the period. In fact, they fell further and faster than they were falling across the rest of North America, where they were also falling rather dramatically. So uh, people were not 
uh, increasing family size in order to increase their entitlement. And you'll also be happy to know that the divorce rate in Dauphin did not increase during the period. So uh, while the guaranteed annual income may be an attack on the American family, the Canadian family is apparently safe. <laughs> Nobody divorced. Um, it turns out that I think children may have been most affected. Um, they tended to stay in high school longer. Um, they had their first child at an older age and they tend to get fewer children over a lifetime as a consequence of the guaranteed annual income. And all of those things are associated with better outcomes in terms of um, income. And so, so I guess the question we want to ask is, are these results still applicable? Do they still matter in the 21st century? And just to raise a few of the issues, I think one thing that I've been emphasizing on this is that a guaranteed annual income is associated with potential savings in other social programs associated with poverty. Now I've talked about health care because the data I have lets me talk about uh, reductions in hospitalization rates. But it doesn't in fact take a great deal of imagination to, um, to realize that a lot of special education funding is also associated with poverty. That um, criminal justice tends to be associated with poverty, family violence, expenditure is associated with poverty. If we can make some reductions in the rate of poverty, we can expect to see savings in other kinds of social programs. The second point is that a guaranteed annual income is in principle a very simple program to administer. Um, during the 1970s, people received their checks from an income on a monthly basis. They actually had to show up with pay stubs if you imagine how this program would work today, it would work in the same way that, the, um, that any other refundable tax credit works. It would work through the income tax system, through the existing bureaucracy. Um, all right. I think um, one of the savings um, from um, the duplicated bureaucracies is that we spend an awful lot of time right now, um, an awful lot of social worker time, trying to help clients navigate the bureaucracy, trying to help clients find their way through a very complicated bureaucracy of social programs. Imagine being able to take some of those highly dedicated and highly educated social workers and take them away from that task and put them into the task of actually running programs that they're trained to run and that would actually help people with the problems they face. I think a guaranteed income is particularly useful for youth unemployment and underemployment. One of the things a guaranteed income does is to subsidize low wages without distorting the labor market in the same way that increases in the minimum wage level. So it doesn't reduce the number of jobs on offer. And in fact, it might make some people more employable than they otherwise would be. It's a way of subsidizing low wages. Most important, at least from my perspective, what's most important is the guaranteed annual income empowers families to make their own decisions and to make their own mistakes. People don't always make the decisions you would like them to make when you give them freedom to do what they want. But a guaranteed income doesn't infantilize people and it doesn't encourage dependency. So, what's left? Um, what's missing, I think, from um, my little presentation so far is that we don't have much of a story about how the families who receive an income um, thought that the program affected their lives. Now, I got a call from a reporter at the Free Press a few years ago, and uh, she said, okay, I, I hear you have this interesting project, tell me about it. So I told her about it, 8.5% reduction in hospitalization rates, a significant reduction in visits to family doctors, et cetera, et cetera. She said, yeah, that's pretty boring. <laughs> I'd like to talk to some of the people. <laughs> and I said, well, turns out I'm not allowed to put you in contact with the people. Um, the ethics board says that I have to protect people's privacy. And she said, ethics. Now, I'm a reporter. I don't have to worry about ethics. And uh, so she went to Dauphin. And she went to the retirement home. And she started buying people coffee. <laughs> and 
And I, I believe the question she asked was, okay, who wants their picture in the newspaper? <laughs> and, um, it turned out that she had a lot of takers. <laughs> Here's the first one, Amy Richardson. And the picture of Amy Richardson's family in the 1970s. Amy Richardson um, had a husband who was ill, who retired at the age of 53, and in fact he died during the Lincoln experiment. She had six kids, so she ended up as a young widow with six kids, and uh, being a very independent person, she decided to raise money by running the Dauphin Beauty Parlor out of her home, out of her kitchen, and um, Mincom came along. And Mincom, she said, allowed her to add some cream to the coffee. It allowed to purchase her a, a few little luxuries, like school books, for her kids. Um, it was to bring her income up to where it should be. It was to add some cream to the coffee. Everybody was the same, so there was no shame. And that's what we heard over and over again. This second um, couple, Hugh and Doreen Henderson, are very um, representative of the families that we found in the boxes. Um, he was a janitor at um, a school which at the time was um, a seasonal job and not a particularly well-paying job. She was a stay-at-home mom. They had two kids. Um, they raised a lot of their own food in a um, very large garden, kept chickens in the backyard. And um, Hugh says, if a kid wants an education and he's willing to pay for it, I think the government should help. If we'd have had more money, I would have loved to pay for university for my kids. Doreen, give people enough money to raise their kids. People work hard and it's still not enough. This isn't welfare. This is making sure kids have enough to eat. They should have kept it. It made a real difference. And this guy's my favorite, Rick Sublitney. Um, he's my favorite because he's a chartered accountant. And this is the sort of person you would almost expect to say, why should I pay my tax dollars to support a program that I'm never going to benefit from? Because realistically, his income is too high, and probably would always be too high. But in fact, he was a big supporter of income. He said, we always felt the problem with the welfare system is it was punitive. You made money and they took it away from you. It seemed to us that income was for people who were on that line. They weren't deadbeats, they needed a bit of a boost. I'd be in favor of it now. Helping someone have a decent living wage is hard to argue with. And I think I'd like to end um, my little presentation today just by talking about um, the, the, the renewed interest, I think, in guaranteed annual income. And it's really coming from two sources. There's quite a lot of interest in Europe for a number of reasons. Um, Switzerland had a citizen's referendum um, in the past year. The European Union received um, a popular petition last year and is about to debate the concept of a basic income. The second big area of support, oddly enough, comes under a different name. The World Bank has been um, supporting um, the use of what they're calling unconditional cash transfer schemes as a means of addressing poverty in low-income countries. And that's met with incredible success. These are usually designed to encourage families to keep their daughters in school, to educate their daughters. And they find that you don't actually have to tell families how to spend the money. If you give families enough money, families can actually make pretty good decisions themselves about how to spend the money in order to improve the quality of life of that family. So giving the family the resources they need to make good decisions usually leads to pretty good outcomes. And so that's the second source, I think, of support for guaranteed income. And I think I'm just going to leave it there and um, ask whether there might be any questions. And I do apologize for this. <laughs> It feels like we're just getting to the tip of the iceberg on a fascinating topic. I'm sure there are questions in the audience. But before our questions, okay. one, one thing. We, thank you very much, Dr. Um, 
Um, we have an announcement from uh, Bill King. Uh, where are you, Bill? Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I'm the president of the local branch of the Canadian International Council. It's a foreign affairs awareness uh, group across the country, Thunder Bay's lucky enough to have a branch. We have a speaker coming up on Thursday night, and it occurred to me that this audience is probably very interested in the kind of speaker we have coming up on Thursday night. It's Dr. Judith Marshall, who uh, recently retired from the Global Affairs Department of Steelworkers. Her specific interest is um, unions, particularly in developing countries like South Africa, and how the development of their unions can impact us more favorably. I think Paul would be a perfect uh, person to talk to about that. How often have we heard that uh, jobs are going to move offshore from Canada because it's cheaper in other areas and so on? And this is how over the workforce is, you know, we've got to cut corners and so on. Her perspective is that if we could develop unions in these other countries and raise their standard of living and their wages and such, that that sort of competition will eventually even out. It's a very global perspective she has. So it's at the faculty lounge of Lakehead University on Thursday night at 7.15. Uh, if you're interested in attending the dinner, which is prior to that, speak to the, uh, the distinguished looking gentleman Ernie Yacht over here. And who is willing to sell you a dinner ticket. Otherwise, if you just like to attend the, uh, the speaker, there's a $10 charge for the, uh, for the speaking event. Again, the faculty lounge on uh, Thursday. Thank you very much. <clears throat>